question. Uh, thank you for Yossi for the invitation and for the people who stayed uh, till this uh, last and late talk. So by now probably half of you recognize that this is the TNF gene and um, <laughs> we uh, using conservation and other features uh, we can detect in the genome uh, coding region. This is the exon and in the green is the intron. So um, although Susan argues that you know we couldn't really call it a code and it's more historical uh, uh, feature but still uh, this is called the genetic code. Um, what we still are missing a lot of information about is actually how uh, this gene would be regulated in which cell types under which uh, perturbation and stimuli and so on. Uh, we know there is uh, sets of uh, cis elements which uh, basically uh, code for the information when and where it will be regulated but we really have a very a small handle on how this works and we really uh, cannot predict and this is the main point where this gene and uh, basically any other uh, of the 20,000 genes we have in the genome where would they be expressed and at what levels and what would, uh, a mutation here how would that change that expression. And this is uh, really the theme that we want to uh, solve. We want to understand um, whether we can call it a code or not, but we want to understand how uh, this information is uh, carried on in the genome. So I think it's obvious, but um, it, it's really important to understand uh, which genes will be expressed where and how much because that is basically the features that make uh, the hundreds of cells in our body different. Lens cells uh, can express crystalline, right, and that's why uh, they're very useful for our eyes and uh, dendritic cells which I'm going to focus about uh, today are part of the innate immune cells and they uh, sit in different uh, periphery organs and detect pathogens and alert the entire immune system. Again, all due to the uh, different genes they express. That is true for fat cells, hair cells, and, and so on and so forth. So how uh, the genome activates these different genes and different cells is what uh, gives them their uh, physio physiological uh, meaning and context. So uh, we relatively know a lot about uh, how bacterial genes are regulated. They have a promoter which is usually uh, very close uh, to the uh, transcription start site. Uh, usually these are uh, short stretches of uh, regulated by a few transcription factors. <coughs> and this is mostly uh, true for yeast, though it, it becomes a bit more complicated. <coughs> in mammals, however, uh, we have a um, much more complicated scene. And this is the best uh, quantitative uh, numbers I could get from the literature. There's many transcription factors, and there are many sites far away, nearby, and, and so on. So uh, really what we want to understand is how actually the transcription factor networks work in mammals. That's the, the goal. Um, and if we think about it, um, transcription factors are right now, uh, to the best of our knowledge, the only uh, factors, proteins, uh, or RNA that can actually detect any uh, sequence uh, specific region in the genome. So basically, they're the only one who can uh, translate or, or read this code. So what we want to understand is how these transcription factor network control this uh, single genome to execute um, both uh, de de developmental decision, which are uh, relatively uh, long scale, they take uh, a few days, and uh, stimulatory responses. And I'll focus a lot about this part today, but you'll see there's a lot of hints of how uh, this part works as well. <coughs> so these cells Obviously, when they see a uh, uh, different environment, they respond very differently. A B, a B cell and a dendritic cell will respond differently when they see uh, uh, pathogens. And uh, obviously, the dendritic cell itself can respond uh, to many different uh, stimuli and very differently. So the goal is to really understand what is these networks, how do they look, what do they do, and how are they organized. And that's the theme of uh, today's talk. <clears throat> so that's what I explained to you that uh, transcription factor networks control the cell identity and response, but you know we really uh, still don't understand how that works. How does the uh, epigenomic uh, regulation that we heard uh, uh, during uh, this talk, how does that fall into this picture and so on. So again, as I explained, the model system 
we work on is uh, dendritic cells, which are part of the innate immune system. Uh, they originate uh, for the bone marrow. All the data I'll show you today uh, is built on these uh, primary uh, cells, which we take from uh, bone marrow. Uh, these cells then uh, migrate uh, to uh, different periphery organs, and then uh, they meet uh, various pathogens. And what I'll show you that when they meet these pathogens, they undergo a very, very uh, dramatic gene response thousands of gene change going up or down, some of them uh, uh, huge folds, uh, 10,000 copies uh, uh, a cell can express of some of these genes uh, from uh, very few copies before the stimuli. And this also has to do with uh, huge changes in the phenotype, the cell uh, changes from being round to having these uh, huge uh, dendrites. Again, and much of this is uh, due to transcription regulation. <coughs> so what I'm showing you, and there's a small take-home message, so don't be afraid of this heat map. What I'm showing you is uh, basically uh, cells before uh, they are stimulated, uh, um, they uh, have uh, very little induction of genes. So I'm so showing you here genes that uh, change after stimuli, 1800, there are more, but this is, uh, catches the main picture. And you can see with uh, different stimuli, you get uh, changes in, in different genes. Red means an upregulated gene, and, and blue is a downregulation. You can see when we treat with uh, bacterial components uh, like uh, LPS or pan 3 cis we have uh, a large set of genes, hundreds of genes that change, and these genes almost do not change when we treat with viruses. On the other hand, when we treat with a viral component, you see a different set of genes being activated, and these uh, genes are also activated by um, uh, gram-negative bacteria, I will not go into that, but are not uh, changed uh, when we treat with gram-positive uh, bacteria. So uh, our first goal was to actually understand what are the components that make uh, these uh, changes, and I'll go briefly because uh, that's uh, been published uh, some while ago. But uh, what we do is we have a, a way to actually uh, select uh, regulators, and the reason we can select <coughs> regulators from the gene expression because these transcription factors and, and many other molecules, including signaling components and, and chromatin modifying proteins, they're also embedded in the same circuits uh, through feedback and feed forward and so on. And therefore, when we stimulate the cells, these genes will either go up and down, and therefore we can detect them, we can detect uh, transcription factors that change, and we say they may be involved in the process, uh, may be true or maybe not, but we can check that later. And uh, we can also uh, select from that a set of output genes which represent the entire response. So then we don't need to again measure uh, all uh, 20,000 genes. We can measure a subset of genes that we know when they change, under what stimuli, and so on. So that uh, creates for us a signature. Once we have the signature, we can uh, now uh, use RNAi or other methods to basically uh, perturb any one of these potential uh, regulators and then uh, measure the output of how uh, the response or the wild type response changes. And based on that, we can build a network of where do these uh, transcription factor uh, sit and how do they impact uh, the response. So again, without going into details, uh, when we uh, did this for the uh, dendritic cell system, there were over uh, 100 uh, transcription factors which were uh, expressed, induced at any uh, time point. And um, perturbing them, we saw that uh, 76 of them impacted significantly uh, the response, uh, changing either uh, the viral pathway, which I'm showing you here, or the inflammatory pathway that I'm showing you here. There was a lot of crosstalk between the, the different networks. Again, I, I'll not go into this uh, today. And we estimated that each gene is regulated by at least uh, 15 factors. And this was really an underestimation. And I'll show you uh, why this was an underestimation. And. Um, one of the questions we wanted to ask, and that was uh, a really open question at, at that time in the field, is um, when we actually say uh, uh, mRNA label, we're looking at um, changes which have to do with both the um, transcription, the processing that we've uh, seen uh, a talk uh, in this meeting, and degradation. And we wanted to see which is the uh, most uh, important or most significant uh, for changing the uh, gene expression response. Because when we measure total RNA level, we're basically looking at everything uh, together. And this was a project uh, run by a very talented uh, graduate student named Michal. <coughs> and again, I'll go quickly uh, through this uh, just to uh, show you uh, new uh, data. 
So again, uh, the way we do this is uh, label uh, newly transcribed RNA by 4-thyroidine. This is uh, a pulse, uh, or metabolic uh, pulse. Basically, uh, this 4-thyroidine uh, will uh, be uh, in the newly transcribed RNA. <clears throat> now we can uh, collect the total RNA and basically separate it into uh, both newly transcribed RNA and uh, the old RNA that was in the cell before. Using, use, using this, we can uh, basically uh, determine the transcription rate without uh, doing any manipulation, like using drugs, which is uh, what people mostly use, uh, as uh, somebody talked uh, during this conference, or uh, using uh, nuclear run-on assay and so on, which uh, for that we need to uh, really do a very um, uh, complicated and, and perturbable uh, assays. So these are uh, basically the numbers. We see almost the entire uh, changes we see are due to uh, changes in uh, transcription rates, and um, very little is, is have to do with the degradation rate, mostly the creation of these uh, very uh, peaky responses, and uh, <coughs> processing of the RNA has, has very little to do with these uh, changes in RNA rates. <coughs> and when I talk about this, people are uh, a bit... Uh, confused and not, you know, very clear about it since some of the changes are really, really quickly. For example, if we look uh, in RNA sequencing, so in, in this case what we're looking here is the transcription of, uh, of EGR1. So this is before stimulation, the accumulation of the reads is uh, the amount of, uh, we see of expression of the gene. So you can see after one hour this uh, gene uh, really is uh, very dramatically expressed. And then in two hours it's uh, almost uh, gone. So um, this is uh, or thought to be a lot due to degradation, but we, when we actually look at the uh, polymerase on this region, uh, we, we hardly see any polymerase before the stimuli. You can see that after 15 minutes, there's a lot of uh, polymerase running on this region, and then after 30 minutes, the polymerase starts to go away, and by 60 minutes, it's already gone. So much of this uh, induction has to do with the recruitment of polymerase uh, through uh, various transcription factors. And again, we can uh, quantify it. You can see that the peak of uh, um, recruitment of polymerase uh, just uh, goes before the peak of expression. And when that decays, there's a, a huge decay in the uh, expression of the gene. So <coughs> what I've shown you is that um, using, using perturbation uh, network, what we can uh, learn about, or a genetic network, we can learn a, a lot about how uh, changing one of the components would really change uh, the output. We can uh, change from one output uh, to another. But what we uh, don't learn from this is the uh, redundancy, which these uh, networks have a lot of redundancy, as uh, I've shown you. There's multiple transcription factor uh, regulating this, and also the dynamics of the system. As you can see, the system is really dynamic. Uh, transcription factors and signaling is, is very transient. <coughs> and a physical network, which would allow us to see where each one of these uh, different components bind, bind on the genome, would really allow us to see which effects are direct, which are not, how is the redundancy in the system, and the, and the dynamics. So th the premise of what we want to really uh, have is a comprehensive and dynamic genome-wide map of all these transcription factors, how and where do they bind in the, in the genome, and that will uh, really help us to understand uh, these principles. So, it, you know, it's a, it's, I think it's uh, well appreciated that this is a, would be a great solution, but there was a, a very big uh, technological barrier because to actually uh, measure uh, dynamic binding of transcription factor on the genome <coughs> in the primary cell is, is very complicated and uh, for many reasons, which I'll go through a few of them uh, right now. So, you know, one solution is to, uh, I didn't talk about it, but the main uh, way that uh, currently uh, we measure in vivo binding of transcription factors or chromatin modification is through uh, chromatin immunoprecipitation. And ENCODE and other large projects, what they did is to measure uh, many different uh, modification and signal. What they did is basically took uh, many people to do uh, this uh, laborious work again and again. So one solution is to actually uh, multiply the students you have in, in the lab. Uh, we thought that wasn't a, a great solution. It's uh, one, for one thing very expensive, and for the other thing it's very hard to recruit students to actually do this kind of work. 
Um, the, the other uh, solution is to really industrialize the process, uh, automate it, and, and make it amendable to do uh, a large number of uh, different factors at, at many time points, and also with very little material, which we actually need when we go uh, to in vivo cells, which are uh, many population are very rare. So what I'm going to show you is a theme that we do for many uh, molecular biology processes in the lab. We uh, basically automate them, and by doing so, we can now uh, ask questions from a, a single factor, a single gene, into uh, a, a network uh, uh, approach and really see the, the principles and the themes that come out of it, and this is, would be one example. Um, the other uh, point I want to tell is I think this is really a revolution that's happening now in, in biology, uh, turning into uh, big data which we, we can then mine and find uh, many things we wouldn't find just by uh, guessing. <coughs> and the third thing about this is um, we think that companies are working with us to help us uh, do these approaches, but that's actually not really true because most companies, uh, their motivation is very different from yours. Most of their motivation uh, comes into actually uh, increasing or getting as much funds as possible from your experiments. And, they, and then they tell you to mix uh, tube A with tube B or, or blue or blue tube with the red tube and so on. And, um, for many processes, actually, it's very, very beneficial, and many students nowadays don't uh, get this training, to actually understand what's in this process and try to optimize it and make it much, much better. Um, this is really uh, going to be an era of a lot of uh, going back to very basic molecular biology and improving uh, various approaches. So uh, basically, uh, what we do here, again, we uh, use various uh, magnetic beads, which we activate with uh, different components to uh, allow to uh, these processes in an automated fashion. So in the first step, uh, we basically pull down the uh, complex of the uh, various uh, proteins or chromatin with the DNA. <coughs> After uh, various uh, steps, which we automate, again, using, uh, uh, using robotics and uh, different uh, magnets. We can then do the entire process that you would do manually, and there's uh, over uh, 15 different steps. Uh, the robot does by itself for uh, 96 uh, different samples. <coughs> the, the same, in the same well, without moving it actually from uh, the, the well it is, and this is very important because the amount of DNA you pull down with uh, specific uh, protein is very low. We then uh, basically purify the DNA, and on uh, a, uh, another bead structure, we basically build the entire uh, sequencing libraries. All in all, there's uh, over 25 uh, various steps that we do in an automated fashion on one well, and we finish with a, a barcoded library that would then we can put multiple experiments uh, into a sequencing machine, and really at a very, very uh, low cost, and uh, a very large number, we can see where transcription factors are now uh, binding the genome. And um, I'll give you, uh, and then as I mentioned, <coughs> this entire process uh, happens in an automatic fashion. This is uh, an example of how this uh, thing looks. So again, um, what I want to say here that, again, it, it's really flexible and many different uh, things, either IPs or protein complexes or, or various uh, DNA manipulation, can, done, can be done do, do, uh, using this scheme. And uh, the entire program of how to do these uh, complicated molecular, uh, molecular uh, enzymatic reaction is planned on, on the robot and then executed uh, in this fashion. And, um, Again, um, this doesn't only uh, allow us to do very large experiments, but also uh, it increases the quality by a lot. The experiments are, are much more similar to one another, and, and that allows us to see fine uh, changes, uh, which is especially important across <coughs> various time points where you want to see uh, changes. <coughs> and the other feature is, um, Again, it allows us to go to really a uh, very small amount of cell for uh, cheap and uh, for chromatin IP and, and, and gene expression RNA sequencing. So the, the bottom line of this is um, basically uh, using this approach, we can really uh, uh, 
go down to the amount of material we need. We can go down to a hundredfold less material wh which uh, we, we needed to use when we used the c uh, conventional uh, chip sequencing approach. And um, <coughs> the throughput is greatly increased. And it also reduces uh, the cost a lot. So now uh, we have this enabling technology to ask many questions on how uh, the physical genome is organized, what proteins are sitting at which time point during differentiation, stimulation across uh, uh, different strains of mouse and, uh, and, and diseases and so on. <coughs> so let's go to actually what we did in this study. Uh, what we use is a temporal RNA sequencing of these uh, cells to basically choose any expressed transcription factors. And uh, there were 180 or so transcription factors expressed in these uh, cell types above some uh, threshold. We uh, took every antibody commercially available for these uh, factors. Um, again, it explains why you actually need a high throughput approach to do this. Out of these, only uh, 38 really worked well in uh, chip sequencing, and we could get uh, good enrichments. And then for these, we did an in vivo uh, time course of, uh, of chip, and all in all, it's 160 uh, different chip seq libraries. Again, this was done by one technician across three months, what I'm showing you right now. So um, I'll show you a glimpse of the data, and then we'll look at, at more uh, global data. So the data looks basically like this. This is 42 KB region of the IL-1A locus. And you can see here, before stimulation, there's hardly any expression, as I mentioned before. After stimulation, there's a huge uh, induction of IL-1A uh, over uh, or thousands of fold induction. <coughs> and if we uh, look at the polymerase, you can see there's uh, no polymerase before the stimuli and then a lot of polymerase after we start the uh, stimulation. Uh, if we look at the uh, chromatin marks, which demark the promoter region, K4ME3, or uh, the two enhancer uh, chromatin uh, marks, K4ME1 and K27 acetylation, what you can see uh, in this picture, though I'm not showing you the time points, they are actually very, very static, and they are very stable across the different stimulation. These same marks appear exactly the same before there is expression and after there is expression. <clears throat> and when we look at the various transcription factors, and this is only to show a few, you can see a lot of uh, binding in this region, specifically on this uh, evacuated uh, nucleosome here. <clears throat> and um, the other uh, important feature that we see is actually transcription factors don't really behave the same. Some are uh, extremely static. They're there before the stimuli just like we see for the different uh, chromatin marks. And others are very, very dynamic. They are at the end of uh, various uh, signaling pathway, and they only bind to the region uh, after some uh, point of time. And, and different transcription factors exhibit very, very different uh, dynamics, which I'll talk in a second. <clears throat> As I mentioned, the histone marks are very undynamic when we look at uh, um, cells which are differentiated and responding. Uh, however, um, during the uh, developmental uh, stages, we actually see a, uh, a very clear uh, dynamics of, of both uh, these uh, marks and the mark of uh, transcription factor. We don't see uh, dynamic in, in the uh, differentiated cells. And as I mentioned, uh, unlike uh, what uh, we see for uh, uh, Drosophila heat shock protein, the polymerase does not seem to uh, be uh, in the start site of uh, many of these uh, early induced genes. And this is, uh, again, different from what uh, John Lisa's lab sees for um, heat shock protein neutrosophila. <clears throat> so the other uh, feature we see that these transcription factors look different in actually where they bind in the genome. For example, if we look at uh, PU1, you can see that most of its binding is very far from the uh, promoter regions of genes. Whereas uh, another factor on the other extreme, ETS2, almost all the binding we see is, is uh, really very close to the uh, transcription start sites on the promoter of the genes. And the different transcription factors exhibit these uh, very different patterns of binding in the genome. Some bind, again, very close uh, to the transcription start site. I others are really spread ap apart and far away. It's also true for the amount of, of binding in the genome. Some really bind in many places. For example, P1, we can see uh, 64,000 uh, different regions it binds, and other binds uh, 
500 uh, regions or some even less. <clears throat> so they really exhibit very different characteristics in dynamics, where they uh, preferentially bind in the genome, the number of binding sites. <coughs> and again, as I mentioned, the dynamics or how they change uh, when we see these uh, stimulatory responses. So uh, CTCF, which is an insulator or mainly an insulator, we can see it almost unchanged during the response, just like the chromatin marks. And this is also true for P1 and CBPB, these two transcription factors. Whereas again, transcription factors at the end of uh, various signaling, comp uh, signaling pathway, which are uh, almost uh, not, do not appear in the uh, nucleus, almost all of their binding is extremely dynamic and appears at different uh, <laughs> time points of the response. For some factors, we also see Depletion, meaning they bind before the stimulation and then they leave uh, their site of binding uh, during stimulation. There's also anecdotes, which is not the main theme, of factors which bind in one region and, and move to other region uh, during the response. But again, these are anecdotes and not the main story. <clears throat> so what, what do we actually see when we put all of this together? So um, what I'm going to show you now is both the uh, ex different expression and uh, the binding of the different transcription factor, both before and after stimulation, to try to explain how actually different uh, sets of genes are turned on and off at different stages and at different levels. So we basically break the RNA-seq expression into late-induced genes, which some of them are highly expressed, uh, sorry, highly expressed and uh, lowly expressed. Similarly, uh, for the intermediate genes and the immediate early genes and the sets of genes here which are repressed, shown in green. And as I mentioned to you and showed you a single example, this uh, expression uh, mimics one-to-one -one the uh, actual uh, binding and recruitment of uh, polymerase uh, or the CTD of the polymerase uh, um, to these uh, genes. And when we look at the uh, various transcription factors and how they bind before stimulation, so the more <coughs> blue it is, the more binding we see of a transcription factor and this is prior to uh, the stimulation of these cells. So what you can see is their uh, transcription factors, in this case P1 and CBPB, which bind almost all the genes. Um, so regardless if they're uh, expressed, induced, repressed, or unchanged, there's other uh, transcription factors who bind many of the genes that we will be later on uh, induced. So they mark this uh, specific genes for, for later induction. These are genes of various pathways, so there is no um, specificity here to which pathway or which uh, response it will have. There are <coughs> sorry, other uh, transcription factors which mark regions for repression. In this uh, case, these are uh, E2F4 and ETS2, which basically mark cell cycle genes which are repressed uh, once the cells goes uh, into an, an inflammatory state. And another uh, interesting feature we see is that highly induced uh, immediate early genes have a lot of uh, binding prior to the actual uh, stimuli. So we see a lot of uh, also the dynamic factors like the NF-kappa-B components and the STAT components binding these genes prior to the stimulation. When we add on top of this uh, the dynamic binding of different factors, so this is uh, the more purple it is, meaning we see uh, joining of binding of various transcription factors at different time points. What we see is there's uh, really an ensemble, an orchestra of how to uh, express or regulate these genes at different stages. You can see basically that RELA dynamically binds to almost all the induced uh, genes, where, whereas binding of IRF1 uh, really is specific and correlates uh, highly to genes that will be later on induced in the response. STAT1 and, and 2 binding really correlates with uh, late-induced genes that, w w that will be highly expressed. And EGR1 uh, correlates well with the genes which, which will be expressed <coughs> early. So really what we see here is that there is a pre-binding of, of many factors. And this uh, orchestration of different factors that come in really uh, shape the timing and the amount of the response. <coughs> so. If we do a principal component analysis of, of all the, f or some of the features actually I s showed you and, and, and several others, how much of the binding is actually in isolation? Some factors bind with, uh, mostly with other factors, other bind in, in isolated places. How much uh, the motif is occupied, meaning how much of the motif of the known transcription factor is actually uh, occupied by the transcription factor in this cell type? The number of bound regions, 
and, and, and so on, and, and other features, what we start to see is actually the transcription factor break into different classes. They don't all uh, look the same. On the very extreme, we have uh, these two factors, P1 and CBPB. These are factors which are um, known and have been shown to uh, basically reprogram uh, pro B cells and, and pro T cells as well into uh, macrophages, and they're known as uh, what people now call uh, pioneer factors. These sets uh, of factors which we see are uh, critical for actually uh, inducing uh, uh, genes, very uh, highly correlated with the expression. Again, what we see is they bind in a very static manner. They almost do not uh, change during the response and are mainly have to do with uh, other components from the same family members which are uh, very dynamic. For example, June B and ATF3 are part of uh, uh, the AP1 complex and we see other very dynamic uh, uh, components. Uh, so one uh, possible role is they may be scaffolds holding uh, this uh, cis site or uh, region for binding of a, of a different partner or a, a signaling molecule. And then on the um, last extreme, we see uh, these uh, transcription factors which are uh, more classical in nature. Again, they are uh, activated through these uh, signaling pathway that then go in to bind their uh, known uh, binding site to uh, induce uh, gene expression. <clears throat> Altogether, uh, what we want to uh, propose is this might be a, a universal model of how actually uh, the single genome could give rise to these uh, many different phenotypes. What we think I is happening is that you have uh, initiation of differentiation by binding of a, a, a pioneer-like transcription factor. These factors bind uh, closed chromatin. Uh, they then open the uh, DNA region, push uh, the, the nucleosome, uh, recruit uh, modifying complexes, which then uh, maintain this state. They're then joined by uh, other transcription factors uh, like June B and, and, and others who basically set up the expression state of the cell and, and maintain it uh, until there's a stimulation and then they uh, recruit other family members and signaling component to the site to actually execute expression. <clears throat> so the last part, which is again uh, ongoing and we really uh, haven't uh, figured it yet or nailed it, but we do see very uh, significant uh, uh, observation, is that how does this uh, binding map, which I'm showing you here, so every uh, row is basically a different gene, and the more uh, black it is mean that we see more binding. How does it correlate with the perturbation? So how is the uh, connection between the actual binding of a transcription factor to a region to the changes in expression once we eliminate uh, this uh, specific factor? And um, the scene is, is very complicated, and we, again, as I said, we still don't understand the, the exact picture, but for some transcription factors, uh, we see a one-to-one -one, uh, connection between where the factor actually binds to, to how um, the uh, gene would be impacted from the binding, meaning for these genes, we, we hardly see any uh, redundancy. And uh, we see this for an entire uh, program, uh, which is the antiviral program. That's uh, expression of uh, many of the antiviral genes. And what we basically see is uh, this entire program is, is regulated <coughs> through an, an AND gate mechanism, which means that we need all the transcription factors to bind the region to actually execute expression. And for all other genes, we see a very different picture where each uh, factor regulates some of the expression of the gene. So this uh, different uh, engineered uh, logic of enhancers, again, is a very critical component, uh, it, whether the gene will be perturbable and how it will uh, change. It's another feature uh, we see here. <coughs> again, and, and this, and this uh, feature is, is, is clearly seen uh, when we actually look at the uh, conservation. These genes regulated uh, by these factors, the antiviral uh, gene, are extremely conserved. All the motifs are completely identical throughout mammalian evolution, whereas genes regulated by uh, the inflammatory pathway are really uh, very rapidly evolving and, and shifting uh, the, this uh, location of the site. So this is a very uh, a clear uh, genomic signature. And um, I'd like to end uh, with this. I'll just uh, tell you what we think would be the impact of uh, doing this for more uh, cell types and more uh, stimuli. 
think that we can uh, start to understand the organization principles of transcription factor networks, um, how these uh, actual uh, changes in both the sites and the factors would, would impact uh, expression, uh, uh, phenotypic expression, and so on. Uh, it will allow us to actually engineer uh, specific genes to be expressed at uh, specific sites. And um, um, I think it would be a very rich uh, resource for the community to actually understand uh, how mutations that we uh, start seeing in patients, how they actually impact and which cell type will be impacted from these uh, changes. <clears throat> and last but not least, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the many people actually who, who did the work, um, both people in my group, Zohar and, and, and Roni, uh, our various uh, collaborators, Aviv Regev, Nir Friedman, and Asaf uh, Weiner from here, and uh, Bradley Bernstein uh, and Chad Newsman from the Broad Institute. And um, thanks to the funding agencies who fund us. And with that, I'd like to end.